So I have the distinct honor and uh, privilege of being able to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Um, I could read a very long bio. Uh, her, her career as a um, civil servant um, is extensive. Her academic uh, credentials are extensive. Um, Dr. Kathleen Hicks is a senior vice president uh, at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, um, focusing on um, a variety of areas within defense and defense strategy. Um, for over a decade, uh, from 1993 to 2006, she was a career civil servant uh, in the Department of Defense with the uh, Joint Chiefs uh, and a variety of other offices. Uh, right now, she is currently um, an adjunct with the RAND Corporation and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and she is also on the National Commission for the Future of the Army, um, which I'm sure many of you have been following closely. Uh, she is also on the Board of Advisors for the Truman National Security Project, and we have multiple fellows in the room, um, I'm very happy to say. And she's also on the Board of Advisors uh, for Soldier Socks, a veterans charity. Uh, Dr. Hicks, uh, excuse me, Dr. Hicks has a PhD in political science from uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a master's from University of Maryland School of Public Affairs, and an AB magna cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa from Mount Holyoke College. Uh, that said, for today's uh, topics of strategic reform and personnel reform and the challenges that are going on as we as an organization try to uh, advance innovative change and disruptive change within the DOD, um, someone with this experience and this expertise, I truly can't think of a, a finer person to be leading our, uh, to be our keynote speaker for today, Dr. Hicks. Well, good morning, everybody, and thanks for having me here. Let me first say I'm very glad that this group has been um, convening for several years now and continues to do so and really to challenge the, the typical mindset that comes out of um, DOD institutions and thinking and out of the community that surrounds it. I'm part of that community. As, as Jim said, I, I sort of grew up, if you will, that long career, by the way, I'm only 26, so it's kind of all very amazing how much I've accomplished. So, um, But I, I am a part of that um, community, and I know you all are as well, but I also hope that you come to the enterprise with some really disruptive um, approaches to challenge the thinking. So this is a year for that, right, for defense reform. We have an incredible amount of interest, particularly on Capitol Hill and particularly in the Senate. Um, on um, a wide range of issues relating to defense reform. There is, that lies on top of a longstanding interest in some specific areas, um, certainly the, the Administration's Force of the Future initiative, acquisition reform both inside DOD, there has been initiative um, from the uh, House Armed Services Committee and from the Senate Armed Services Committee. So there's a lot of energy around defense reform, and of course it's helped along by what's perceived to be um, a crunching of the resource picture during a time of um, incredibly continuous pacing challenges for the United States. So that gives even more impetus uh, for finding areas to save money. So what is really behind the move for defense reform overall? Well, it's, it's as that brief description gives you a sense, there's no one thing, and in fact, in contrast to pre-1986 for the Goldwater-Nichols Act, which is, of course, everyone calls to mind Goldwater-Nichols these days, um, when there was a, a relatively clearer sense and, and consensus around what the issues for defense were, and they were about the jointness and the capability of the force in the field, um, there's a lot of different viewpoints today on why we need defense reform and what it should do. At CSIS, we were instrumental, I wasn't there at the time again, I'm only 26, in um, 1983 to 1985 and going into 86, um, CSIS undertook some of the foundational study work that led into the legislative process for Goldwater Nichols. It was led by a young staffer by the name of Bill Lynn, who eventually became the Deputy Secretary of Defense, and by uh, another young gentleman, Barry Blackman, now at the Stimson Center. Um, and they uh, published a major report 
that was leveraged by Capitol Hill. And ever since then, we've been very involved at CSIS in issues related to reform. We also did a major series that I was involved in um, in roughly the 2005 to 2008 timeframe known as the Beyond Goldwater Nichols series, where we talked not only about defense reform, but interagency reform. And then, you know, thinking third time's the charm, I was involved in the project on national security reform. Um, and here we are today, right? Uh, so every so often we get these urges or, uh, that, that bring together um, a consensus of people who think there should be major reform, and we've hit one of those times now. So the big question for reform is how do you, if you're going to do it, how do you do it well, and how do you make sure that the solutions that you put forward are actually going to get the desired outcomes and hopefully create more value than they break, which is a, a framing that um, former Deputy Secretary of Defense Gordon England used to use uh, when we talked about defense reform in the, in the late part of the Bush administration. Um, so let me just talk about a few of those dynamics that are happening now and some impetuses for reform. Of course, there is, as I've already mentioned, the efficiency issue. Um, how do we do more with less? And there you see issues like infrastructure being incredibly important, right? Uh, whether you call it BRAC or infrastructure reduction, there is a clear and um, pressing view that the um, the amount of infrastructure that DOD is managing and maintaining is well beyond its need at the moment. Now, conservatively, you could say, well, we should, we should keep that. You never know when you might want it. But the fact of the matter is we don't need it now, and there's um, a huge uh, amount of dollars that could be freed up, mostly, honestly, in the civilian and military personnel, particularly civilian personnel, that support those infrastructure, right? So right away, you see the political challenge with brackets, not just installations, it's people. And these people aren't in the Washington, D.C. area. These aren't the federal workers most people talk about. These people are out in communities. And if those installations go away, the fear is so do the jobs, and so do the economic bases of a lot of those congressional districts. So very challenging politically to talk about BRAC, but very challenging to achieve the outcomes of the Defense Department without going to those politically difficult areas. And I could go on on the politically difficult. I'm sure you've talked about some of these today. Certainly, um, health care reform issues, um, benefits and pay issues, all are wrapped up in these sort of very difficult, real world challenges of hard choices where people's livelihoods are involved. Um, and yet, there is this overall uh, corporate, if you will, structural challenge to the Defense Department. The other major issue set is how effective are we as, as a DOD? This is what drove, the, really, more than anything, the 1986 Act, was the sense that we are, we are less than the, than the sum of our parts, right? And so the big emphasis then was on the jointness of the force in the field, its capability in the field, not just jointness for the sake of jointness, but jointness because it produces the most effective military force in the world. Well, I think most people would gauge that Goldwater Nichols was by and large successful in advancing us. I don't know that everyone thinks we're all the way there, but advancing us on that military effectiveness viewpoint. Now, what is the challenge set today? And this is where you hear a variety of different viewpoints, but probably the most common refrain you hear of late um, is that we have a new challenge set for the future that is trans-regional, cross-regional, multi-domain, and we don't necessarily have effective ways of managing that around the world. So that's one major challenge set that's sort of been put out there. The question is, what do you do about that? How much of that is about DOD? And how much of that is about, again, sort of broader interagency and even beyond, not to make it an impossible problem, but even beyond um, federal interagency issue to sort of how do we work with private partners, federal government to private partners to international partners? What's the right way to deal with, say, for instance, gray area challenges some people call those hybrid challenges, where you're talking about economics, energy, political subversion, um, and uh, proxy warfare. Uh, and a lot of that's not about DOD. So there's a challenge for DOD to both lead and do what it can control and what its authorizers can control, but at the same time recognize the limits of how far that will go. There's also one other thing happening this year. You may or may not have noticed if you turned on the television, there is a presidential election cycle underway. So across all of this is the, is the political dimension of it. Um, 
part of what I think you will uh, want to be looking for kind of at the end of that cycle post-November is how does a new administration and a new Congress think about defense reform as part of its major agenda going into 2017. Um, and let me just pick four areas just to get the conversation going, and then I'm going to stop so we can have a conversation. Four things that I think are going to be important as you look past November in particular. The first is trying to get budget stability. There is plenty of argument to be had about what is the right level of spending for DOD. I think what is probably uh, generally agreed to is the lack of a common viewpoint about what that level is, not what it should be, but what it is and what it is going forward for several years creates a lot of um, discontinuity between what we say our strategic ends are and what we're going to do about them, how we deal with defense reform as a piece of that picture, or how much we just cross our fingers and wait for more money to come along, which prevents us from having to pursue a lot of the defense reform pieces. So getting a budget deal um, of some variety, whether, however that's manifested, is going to be incredibly important to defense reforms for understanding how those issues situate within the broader sense of where we're going on defense. The second thing that's incredibly important, of course, is the ongoing debate about acquisition reform. And I am not an acquisition reform expert in the details, so uh, please don't ask me detailed questions uh, that I'm not going to be able to answer. But let me just say, generally speaking, what we want to be able to do is be able to leverage technology and, and um, innovation beyond the technology piece at a faster rate, create lanes that allow us to leverage that more quickly and adapt more reasonably, um, and to leverage it from the commercial sector and international partners. So that's beyond, if you will, just traditional acquisition reform to FMS reform, export control reform issues, um, let alone the commercial sector as we're trying to do now. So that's a whole body of work there. And let me just add from my perspective, um, in addition to the materiel end, we have a real challenge in DOD today institutionalizing that innovation. And it's got to go beyond the materiel piece. Concepts of operation, institutionalizing experimentation, a lot of things that we used to have some institutions dedicated to. And again, there were views that maybe they weren't efficient. But, but the function of, say, a GIFCOM or an Office of Force Transformation, these are functions that aren't really clearly delineated today. Um, and there aren't really strong budgets that go with them. Uh, we used to have things like uh, uh, competitive funds, where you could go after experiment, joint experimentation money if you were a COCOM, to look at things like um, you know, uh, high-speed vessels, things like that. Um, that. Those kind of buckets, those Bishop Fund buckets, are, are basically gone today because we have been focused on not experimentation, but a real-world world laboratory, especially if you're in the ground forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now the question is, how do we take that kind of learning we did on the battlefield and come back to a world where we understand how to bring that in, even when we're not on the battlefield. Um, a third area is, of course, personnel issues and force of the future issues. This is both on the military side and the civilian side. I think there is incredible opportunity on the civilian side. There were some decisions that have been made over time that reduced, if you will, politically the readiness of um, uh, the, the last administration and this administration to pursue some of those kinds of radical reforms. I think there's more bipartisan consensus, if you can even believe that phrase exists today, around the idea that we can progress on civilian personnel reform without fundamentally threatening the rights of civilians inside, um, as a former civilian, uh, inside the Defense Department that makes sense, that are logical, and that have to get done if we're going to innovate for the future. We have to be able to shape this workforce. On the military side, same thing. We have a different, different issue set. We have the world's best military. Um, uh, but at the same time, we see areas where we can go further in terms of bringing in folks through lateral pathways um, and um, making sure we have the right skill sets for the future. Obviously, the efforts that have been done to open up the pool of available folks through issues like um, no exceptions for women in combat um, and other like efforts that allow us to access the best talent pool. There are real challenges to that, to that pool over time, from issues like obesity to the number of people who are interested in uh, pursuing military careers, again, to the skill sets, the quality and the skill sets challenges that have to be tackled if we're going to have the force that we want to have for the 21st century. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the fourth major issue really is infrastructure. 
we have to be able to bring down that infrastructure cost. Um, and BRAC has been the way we have talked about it in the past because BRAC was itself a way around the political challenge. Well, BRAC has now become it, uh, the political challenge. As a survivor of running many a QDR or defense strategy document, it's very similar, right? QDR was created because there was a view that there wasn't strategic thinking. And then QDR became sort of the, the, the negative, the thing to be avoided. You have essentially the same thing happening with BRAC. Now BRAC is the ugly word. So, I raise that only to say maybe it's not BRAC, because BRAC is a mechanism, right? But we have to find some political pathway forward to reduce infrastructure if we're going to get at these defense reform goals. So um, I'll stop there simply by saying we do expect the SASC markup to come out today. We'll see what they want to do on defense reform. It should be sporty. Um, the HASC mark has already come out. Uh, we also have in addition to that, uh, Mac Thornberry put out an amendment yesterday to the NDAA to put in some uh, requirements on the NSC. I'm happy to talk about NSC reform as well. Um, so it's a lively debate. Uh, how the administration will engage, I think, will be very interesting over the summer. And then how the Hask and Sask sort of conference over this issue, which I anticipate not happening until at least early fall, because I expect there to be um, some interesting issues to talk about. Um, I think that will all be playing itself out through the fall. And again, the real issue set time frame will be that November to probably March post a new administration and early in that legislative cycle for the next time. I think there's opportunity here to make some, if, if, we, if the stars align, which they don't often, uh, you have an opportunity to make real changes through defense reform. So let me stop there and open it up to any questions folks have. This one right over here. During the 2005 BRAC, a, save, a, a cost estimate was come up, was developed at $21.5 billion. That was approved by the president, approved by the Congress, and within two years it rose to $37 billion. And we stopped counting at $37 billion. And the number is somewhere north of $40 billion. Why would the Congress ever trust DOD ever again with a BRAC? Uh, where to begin with that? You could say that about almost any process and or product in DOD. So I think there is a basic trust issue. Yeah, there's a basic trust issue. So we can all just do nothing and have the military we have today, but not even Congress wants to do that, right? So we, we try to make these improvements in our cost estimation in the way in which we um, uh, go through the process, whether it's BRAC or, say, an F-35, right? So you make a very valid point. If the question is, should Congress ever trust DOD with a BRAC, the clear answer has been no, right? But the payoff, the 10-year payout, is clearly there. It's like, yeah, it's clearly there. You are clearly saving money, and you have, you have um, municipalities, excuse me, that are able to show economic benefit from, yes, from reclaiming uh, land. I've been at this for 35 years. Who are you? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm Dan Cosgrove. I'm Where retired, so I'm retired. OK, from? Um, I ran a company Government? called Defense Facilities Corporation. Okay. Great, that's what I was a council to a federal agency. I was in the Marine Corps Reserve. Great. And I've done all five of the BRACs. Okay. And, and you believe we should never reduce any infrastructure? Oh, no. I think okay. we should. So people that is the question. What's the right mechanism? Have, some people on the Hill have suggested that we set a number, say $21.5 billion. Uh -huh. And if you overrun by 75%, uh -huh. you eat it out of your budget. Yeah. And of course, like any cost plus program, yep. DOD has said, oh my God, yeah. we can't be yeah. held to I a budget. I think you're making the point I'm trying to make. We've been obsessed with BRAC as the mechanism. It's not about BRAC. It's about how do you bring infrastructure into alignment. I don't know the answer to how to do that. And I don't think we should limit our thinking to just BRAC. I think we need to get past obsessing with BRAC as the mechanism and think about ways to reduce infrastructure that are politically viable. That was the only point I was making. But I also do think you can get savings. We have had savings through BRAC. I'm not going to argue. Oh, OK. There, well, some savings is savings. OK. Next question.
So if we can keep on Brack for a second. Um, <laughs> There's, there's been some discussion uh, in, in the core and in NAVFAC that they, they've gotten some traction on the Hill for uh, something that is not called BRAC and is not BRAC but would reduce facilities that are not yeah. currently in use um, and allow them to reinvest in facilities that they actually could use. Um, it sounds as though, and I think you made a really good point, that um, the, the political reality is that these are difficult political decisions to shut down facilities and that it's not the mechanism that makes it politically difficult, it's the fact that you're doing something that is damaging to individual communities and we have a, a regionally representative government that makes it difficult to do. So, you know, even if you rename it, I guess my yeah. question is, is there a, a pull that ultimately would do this other than, than calling out cost savings, again, which, uh, you know, it's a, it's a reasonable point from a budgeting perspective, but doesn't necessarily have the political traction. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the fundamentals, you are, you are right, the fundamentals you have to have either A, is an overriding cost issue that, that creates such a dynamic that you have to, that you, you catapult over the political problems. That is a rare occurrence. It, it has occurred five times, but it is a rare occurrence. The other factors that become very important, of course, the communities, right? How... Um, how forward-leaning is a community about how it might want to reuse land, and that will vary on many factors based on where this is and what the leadership of the community is and what other economic opportunities are out there. So a big piece of it is the community. How do you build a community relationship? Obviously, what, what BRAC did provide, which, which the me, where the mechanism can matter, is the um, relief to communities that's built into that. So, so mechani the mechanism does become important in terms of how you are easing that political challenge, maybe is the way to put it. And then the other thing is the, the reality or the nature of our workplace environment. So we still think about installations, right? And we think about people going to work at the installation and if that installation goes away, that person goes away. I think that's part of it too. It's part of that larger demographic issue or maybe I should say workplace issue about what is the right footprint and facility approach for DOD in the future and are human beings necessarily tied to uh, a location that is in their district, in, in that particular district. Um, I don't have, again, the answer to that question, but I think we need to start reframing the issue in those kinds of ways that are much more disruptive, if you will, and thinking very hard about how we envision uh, workers for DOD, again, it's going to be different if you're at a depot, right, um, and you're building something or you're maintaining something than if you are um, providing IT support, right, inside the force. So thinking through that workforce of the future and how it um, physically lays down and the extent to which that is or is not linked to a specific um, location in a district, I think that becomes part of the answer as well. Okay, how about a non-BRAC question? Yeah. Thank you. Um, hi, ma'am. Kimberly Jackson, Rand Corporation. I also used to work for you in OSD policy. Oh, great. Um, my question has nothing to do with BRAC. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is actually, um, in terms of your work on the National Commission of the Future of the Army, yeah. I note looking at the commissioners that you tend to stick out. Um, it's a lot of old white guys who have a lot, of, um, a lot of experience that's absolutely esteemed. But thinking about the future of the Army and the future of our services and the Department of Defense writ large, I was wondering if you could comment on what the utility would have been of perhaps utilizing um, more younger uh, junior officers or even field grade officers um, in that study, considering that they are truly the future of the Army and our armed services? Well, um, what I would say is we tried very hard through the commission, which is actually now concluded, um, to leverage that whole Army, right? So lots of trips to talk to people um, around the country, active reserve, National Guard, you know, uh, have frank conversations in small groups, unmonitored, if you will, um, to talk our own staff. Our own staff, of course, was full of field grade officers. And um, we also had the former um, 
uh, you know, uh, Sergeant Major of the Army, which was incredibly important on the commission. He had a, a very strong and important voice on the commission so that we got not just that officer viewpoint and general officer viewpoint, but that we really got that NCO view. And then he was also ensuring that we were talking to enlisted folks again um, active and reserve. So I don't think at the end of the day um, you should take away from the commission makeup itself the whole of how we approach the problem. And certainly on the issues that we were looking at, uh, you know, we had to be thinking about that army of the future. I was charged, for instance, with, the, with being the commissioner running the working group on sort of the future challenge set. And that was something very important to us. What were the leadership skills of the future? And to do that kind of work, of course, we had to engage with folks who would be in the Army in the future. Um, but I, I take your point, and I think the sh these commissions send a very important signal when you, when you put them together just in how you present um, the commissioners. And that's something that you know, hopefully Congress and any administration are thinking through when they put these commissions together. So, yeah. Hi, um, Hi, my name is Alvin Sari. I've actually worked with Mr. Hicks. Worked with Mr. Hicks. Oh, great! Yeah. That's my husband, Mr. Yeah. Hicks. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so, 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 so my question has to do. I really did not load these questions into the audience. Yeah. All right. Um, so my question has to do um, with risk assessment in yes. terms of how that leads to reform. So I understand the old Goldwater Nichols is about jointness. The mm -hmm. new one's about efficiency and effectiveness. Mm -hmm. um, within effectiveness, an interesting paradox is. We're very likely to see de not engagements necessarily in, but demands for stability sort of operations, crisis yes. response. Um, but those are usually, you know, low grade. Um, they're risky, but they're not existential. Mm -hmm. Whereas we're not likely to see something with Russia and China. But if it did happen, it'd be terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so, and, and both the and focusing on both is very difficult. Um, one of the and and it has different impacts for the services. Like obviously, if we're going to specialize in crisis response. Marines Navy integration becomes not just very important, but critical. And so like, what, what is a good theory of risk assessment in understanding how to develop the effectiveness of sure. reform? So, um, you know, I've done force planning for a long time, and, and my preferred method is portfolio management. But I have to have money, if you will, I being the representation of DOD, to, ha to be able to portfolio manage. So if I've got sufficient funds and, I can, and, and this threat spectrum is within sufficient bounds, I can look across that and I say, OK, what do I have? What's sort of the, the big bets that are pretty ubiquitous? I know I'm going to ISR. I know I'm going to use it everywhere. The type of ISR I need is going to be different. Uh, lift, you know, things like this that are that are needed in almost any kind of contingency. I can sort of focus on uh, those as sort of big bets that I know I want, and then I can kind of place the small bets. Right, this is typical investor approach. The challenge we face today, in my opinion, is we have really reached that point where I think we need to fundamentally assess whether we, it is realistic to pursue a portfolio approach anymore. Again, because there is this disconnect between the degree of national ambition, which could change, right? That's, this is, that is the uh, realm of politics. Um, and the degree of resources, capability, expertise that is available across the federal government to manage those challenges and then DOD's piece of that. Um, it's art, not science, so one has to, you know, use your own professional judgment about when you kind of cross that line. But my view is we, we're, we're probably across that line today, and we still act. We say we have this level of national ambition. We use this portfolio approach, and we say we can cover that threat spectrum, but we're, we're really, like, beyond thin in some areas. So I think this comes to this issue of you have a new administration. What will be the plan, both on strategic ends? What is it we want to do as a nation? How does DOD fit into that? And then what are the resources available? And I think that's where you may need to reevaluate. Defense reform, you know, there's, there's a lot of levers you can pull, almost endlessly. I will just name some. Defense reform, again, is a piece of it. Can I get more money out of the money I'm putting in? Um, can I change my utilization of the force for the Army Commission? One of the things we talked about is that the reserve, we felt that the reserve component was not being used to its fullest uh, extent, that the Army was overusing the active force. There are resource reasons, by the way, and others for that, but um, that's a problem. You're not making the most of the force that you have. 
Uh, you can get into issues, of course, like bogged well, um, and that can have long-term consequences, but that's a professional judgment again. There can be some science to that. But you know, where, does the, where is it the healthiest point at which to use the different components of the force? How often should they be home? How long should their tours be? Again, trying to make more out of the force. And then you get to the probably much harder. You know, if, if, if I'm counting BRAC on the easier side, the much harder side are things like um, uh, reducing redundancy in the force that somebody like me who's somewhat conservative on force planning would prefer not to do. So this gets you into issues of do I assign portions I don't actually think this threat spectrum is two-dimensional, but for purposes of this description, go with me for the moment that it is. Do you assign portions of the threat spectrum to different parts of the force and not have that kind of um, joint redundancy? Um, instead, you have this reliance um, on support from the different components to one or to the different services to one another. So that's one approach. The other is, of course, to give up parts of the threat spectrum, to say, you know what, we're not going to, hello, over here, we're DOD, we are not going to do that anymore. We kind of did a form of that in 2012, we, we the uh, Obama administration, by saying we would no longer um, size our forces for large-scale, long-duration uh, stabilization operations. I'm not a fan of that articulation despite being the author of that articulation. Um, uh, but you know, sometimes you're the, you're the fingers and not the brain. So um, I think that's, I, I, again, I am conservative. I understand the reasoning for it in a resource-constrained environment. You can make choices like that if you have to, and, and some would argue we had to. Um, but you run a risk at the end of the day. If DOD says, we just, we're not going to be ready for it, but if you've been around DOD a long time, you're in the back of your head, you're saying, but they're going to ask us, and when we're not ready, they're going to be really mad, and people are going to die. Um, so I think that's the kind of, na again, it's a national conversation. I think sometimes we, we become much too technical. We sort of leave it over to a technical conversation inside the Pentagon when a lot of these questions fundamentally are national level dialogues that need to be had. All set? I was, I was yep. going to say before that it was last question, but I did not realize that, that was going to be such a, a big question. <laughs> um, we, uh, so for those who were here previously, and you're already familiar with that, but at, oh. For the, for the people who are coming to us, or who are following this uh, video live stream, um, at, inherently our, our mission is to be an innovation engine within mm -hmm. the Department of Defense. And the, the way that we choose to do that, our, our mission, or our way of doing it is to inspire, connect, and empower. And the, the role of the keynote is to truly hit on the inspiration piece. And I, there's no doubt in my mind that with the topics that you just, just the, the innumerable list of challenges that you just brought up to us. Uh, the people in this room, I am included, are inspired. Um, as, a, as a small token to that, towards that end, uh, as a way of simply saying thank you, we, we get our inspiration from leaders like you who are able to in engage us with those ideas. My only ask is that we can help you, or my only offer is to help you continue to uh, think of some new ideas. Um, it's just helping you th uh, find new ideas and to save them uh, for, right. for future use. Um, just some of the inspiration that uh, we here in this room do. Great. So. Thank you very much. It was an honor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.